You know, the last time I gave a talk, talk at Optic West, all my talks everywhere have been about the creative side of photography, the aesthetics of it, composition, color, technique, that sort of thing. And I got the comment from a couple of people, man, she's intense. You know, they, they felt I was way too intense when I was talking about photography. So I watched myself and I thought, yeah, I am kind of intense. And I was like, I need to chill a little bit. I need to take it easy. How do I do that? Maybe talk about something I'm not so passionate about. Making money? <laughs> so that's how this came about. I don't see too many people talking about monetizing image making. So I was like, well, let me ju jump into that and talk a little bit about it. And uh, there is a reason why I used this image as a title image, because we are all looking for that proverbial pot of gold at the end of the rainbow when it comes to trying uh, to make money from photography. This was taken at Westerhorn during an Iceland workshop. Um, we had gotten to this place. It was raining. It was overcast. You know, it's, it's cold, it's wet, we're all kind of miserable. We're sitting in the car and contemplating, should we get out or should we just skip it and go back to our warm cabins, you know? If we were logical, normal people, we would have gone back to the cabins, but we are not, right? We are nature photographers, so what do we do? We get down in the rain, set up our tripods, and hope and pray that a miracle will unfold before us. And sure enough, it did. The clouds parted, this gorgeous rainbow draped itself over the mountain, and what was even better is that it started to reflect on the beach as the water washed in and out. So we got this phenomenal um, opportunity to photograph it. This kind of reminds me that if you are thinking of either starting a career in photography, or you're thinking, you know what, this hobby of mine is getting to be quite expensive, I wish there was a way to monetize all these beautiful images I'm making. We won't know if it's possible unless we try, right? Just like we stood there in that rain and storm and said, let's wait for the rainbow. You got to try. And if you don't try, you will never know whether there is a chance to succeed or not. A Little bit about myself. I am a physician and a photographer. So you're probably thinking, why the heck is she talking about making money? I don't think it's that important for her, so why is she here? You know, think about this. If you have a duck, right, a duck that is really, really hungry, and he's trying to catch some fish to eat, he's going to have his head under the water, and he's going to be paddling as fast as he can, searching for those fishies, right? He doesn't have time to look up and see what the other ducks are doing. He's so lost in finding his own food. On the other hand, if you have a duck with a half full stomach, that duck is not paddling as hard. And that duck has the time to look around and see what the other ducks are doing, where they seem to be catching more fish, which part of the pond seems to be more successful for them. I am that second duck. So I am often looking around at others and wondering, well, how are they monetizing their photography? What are the different avenues we have open to us? And so I am coming at it from a different perspective and hopefully will be able to offer that insight to you. I work three days of the week as a radiologist. It's considered a very high stress job. So they give us about eight to 10 weeks of vacation, all of which goes into my photography. So between working only three days and having uh, quite a bit of vacation, all of it being invested in photography, I end up spending about 60% of my time in photography and about 40% in medicine, and will very soon be transitioning into a full-time photographer. Yeah, I gave my notice. <laughs> okay. So these are tips that I wish to share with you in monetizing your photography. This is just my personal journey. Hopefully some of this will resonate with you. Hopefully, I will be able to share some insight of how things have come about, um, especially for someone who has not invested 100% of their time in the pursuit of photography. How do things work out? How can you end up as a professional photographer when you did not quite start on that route? Tip number one, I probably use this for every talk of mine. So the first slide you see is always about finding purpose. So once there was a man 
who visited a quarry. There were a bunch of stone cutters over there. Now, so he walks up to the first stone cutter. He's bent down, hammering hard. You know, it's hot. He's sweating. He's grimacing. And he's working really hard. And the man walks up to him and asks the stone cutter, what are you doing? And the stone cutter replies, I'm working hard to earn a living. Then the man walks to the second stone cutter. And he asks, what are you doing? Now, this guy is super busy. He's hammering as hard as he can, doesn't even look up at the person questioning him. And he says, I am working to be the best stone cutter in the county. Then he walks to the third stone cutter. Now, this guy is whistling as he works. He has a gleam in his eye. He has a smile on his face. So the man walks up to him and says, what are you doing? And he replies, I am building a cathedral. So you see, the attitude with which we approach the very mundane tasks makes a huge difference in our overall journey. So when we're talking about photography, there will be times when it feels really painful, isn't it? When we're standing out there, hiking up these mountains, standing in really bad weather, don't get our shots. If we focus on those moments, then we forget to focus on the big picture, which is we are creating art. One image at a time to make this world a better place. So it's important for each one of us, I feel, to first identify the purpose behind our photography. Why are we making images? And we need to have that purpose transcend our selfish individual needs and reach out to the greater community. If we have that purpose within us, the journey becomes much more bearable, much more rewarding. And the hurdles we face along the way don't seem as stressful. So for me, the purpose was basically to create art that could be used to create an ambiance of healing in medical centers. I work in the hospital, and I felt that it was necessary to approach healing in a holistic way and create an environment that does not feel intimidating, that does not feel scary or anxiety causing. Rather, it should be one that you walk into and feel like you have walked into a safe haven. So that's what I started doing, creating images that would have that sort of healing impact and started putting them up in hospitals and medical centers. The first place that I did that was the very hospital I worked at. And for those of you who watched my uh, panel talk earlier, um, you remember what I said? This happened very early on in my career, 2011, 2012. I had just learned how to start shooting uh, landscapes, did not understand a lot of the technique, compositions were still a little bit off, made a ton of mistakes. And when I pitched the idea to the hospital board, they absolutely loved it and said, yeah, let's start putting up these images. So the next thing I know, the entire hospital is flooded with my images. Literally, you know, that was the entrance to the hospital I showed earlier. This is the waiting room for the big outpatient centers and all of the lobbies and hallways. Everywhere, the pictures were flooded up. The first week was extremely painful for me to get through. You know why? Because when I walked in, that sensor spot that I had missed was staring at me as big as my face. They were all printed at like eight feet, 10 feet, and I was like, holy cow, how could I be so bad at photography? How could I have made this many mistakes? So I went to them and said, could you please take them down? Because if my photography friends, photographer friends saw this, they would laugh at me. So can you please take them down? Of course they did not. They said, uh, these images are great because they were looking at the feeling they produce and they had a very positive impact on the atmosphere in the hospital. The staff loved it, the patients loved it, and gradually over a period of one month, I learned that it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. Did you know Pablo Picasso painted 13,500 paintings? We know how many, five? If Picasso can do that, so can we, right? It's okay. It's okay to generate not so perfect images. It's okay to generate quantity, and then look for quality, because without quantity, we don't get to that quality factor. So don't be afraid to make the mistakes, and find that bigger purpose in life. 
So that's tip number one. Tip number two. You know, oftentimes people say, if you're passionate about something, just jump into it, right? It's sink or swim, throw caution to the wind. Just throw yourself into it. That probably works if you're in your early 20s and you have you know, a trust fund or something. <laughs> I think I cannot take a chance. I was a mother before I was a physician. I did it all backwards, right? Married in my early 20s, had the kids before I even turned 25, and now I'm in medical school and I'm a mom and I have no money. <laughs> all the money goes into um, paying the tuition fees. So if I start thinking about having an alternate career and giving up some of my medical uh, career income, that's scary because what's going to happen to my kids? You know, uh, How are we going to pay for all the expenses? So even though I say be fearless, that's not exactly what I'm trying to get at. This is the bayou, right? Um, probably a bunch of you have been there, photographed it. It's very beautiful to photograph. In autumn, I was just there two days ago. The cypress trees change color. This picture is literally from maybe two or three days ago. And um, it's just such a glorious atmosphere. Uh, the water is really cold. So you know the alligators and poisonous snakes and everything else that lives down there is sort of sleeping for the most part, hibernating or so you hope. And you can sit in your kayak and you know, sort of enjoy that ethereal atmosphere of going around. The very first time I went there, that was about five years ago, I went with a guide who was well experienced in kayaking, knew the swamp like the back of his hand, and had done a lot of photography there. He was also a good one foot taller than me and stronger. So we get there, and I'm happily paddling away in the kayak, you know, so happy that I'm doing a great job. He gets down into the water, sets up his tripod, looks at me, and he says, what are you doing? You need to get out of your kayak. You need to get into the water. You need to set up your tripod. And you need to start doing long exposures. I thought about this for a second. I was getting plenty good pictures in the kayak. I was like, is this really necessary? I was like, um, I don't know about that. Then I was like, Sapna, you've got to be fearless. Come on. You've got to step out of your comfort zone. You've got to push yourself to make these images. So I got out of the kayak, set up my tripod, and started shooting. A realization crept in that the person who is one foot taller than me, the water level comes only to his knees. For me, it's up to my hips. And I'm thinking to myself, hmm, wonder if this was a logical decision. How am I going to flip my legs back into the kayak without tipping it over or getting my gear into the water? How is this going to be accomplished? Then all of a sudden, I feel a little bit of coldness and wetness at my feet. Guess what? I bought some cheap waders, because I was being cheap, and they started leaking. So the water started coming around my feet. Next thing you know, past my ankle, up my calf, and the next thing I know, I have freezing water completely around my legs. If I thought it was difficult to get into the kayak without the water, imagine what it would feel like with water logged legs there. And that's how people drown and die in the swamp, right? So now I'm thinking, now that was a stupid decision. Thinking I should be fearless. That was an illogical, stupid decision. Shouldn't have done that. And as I'm thinking, what am I going to do now? I'm in the middle of nowhere. How am I going to make it to the shore? I can't walk through this mud. I can barely move. How am I going to get myself out of this trouble? In that instant, I feel something slithering between my legs. <laughs> to this date, I do not know if it was a snake, if it was an alligator, or it was my pure imagination. I swear to God, I don't know. But what I do know is that I, in that instant, turned into Wonder Woman. I was able to lift my legs onto the kayak, 10 seconds flat, second leg comes on, grab my tripod, grab my camera, out of there paddling like I have a motorboat. <laughs> so you know what? Fear is actually a great motivator, isn't it? So instead of saying fearless, here I am photographing, maybe I should tell you, be afraid. Be very afraid, sometimes that comes in handy. But really what I'm trying to say is you've got to weigh the risk versus the reward. You have to take baby steps. We start off with passion, but we have to acquire the knowledge. 
We have to be persistent in acquiring that knowledge and finally gain the ability to go ahead and do what we really want to do. Now, a few years later, I understand the swamp. I know that you check with the tripod how deep the water is before you get into it. You kind of dig around to make sure there's no gators or snakes around. And once you do that, you can be out there in the middle of the night and start creating magical images where you can light paint the cypress trees, maybe even catch some stars in the sky, and it becomes a truly wonderful experience. But it takes time to get there. So what I would like to say is, it's going to be a long haul if you want to indulge in the business of photography. There are certain steps that you will have to go through, be in it for the long run, don't expect quick results, and the journey will become rewarding eventually. That brings us to tip number three. So when I first started photography, I actually did self-portraiture, as you can see. Self-portraits in the environment. How many of you guys fell for that? How many of you think that's really me? <laughs> it's always a pleasure when I put that up and people don't go, ha, 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 as soon as I say self-portraiture. So then I know I'm doing OK. Oh, I never have a body that looked like that. That's, that's a belly dancer, you know? Um, so I'm talking about finding your niche. You know, what is it that floats your boat? What is it that you're most passionate about? It's important to establish that niche in order for you to be successful in photography. Say you needed a knee replacement, right? Would you go to an orthopedic surgeon or would you go to maybe a family practice guy? You would seek out the specialist, right? You want to go to someone who is an expert in what you're trying to accomplish. It's the same in photography. So whether you want to be a wedding photographer or a newborn photographer, maternity, whatever it is that is your genre, once you find your niche, you will have to hone down your skills and show people you're an expert in that. Going back to this image, you know, we're out there. This was at Cliff House in San Francisco, which I'm sure a lot of you know. So we're standing on the rocks there, and you know how cold San Francisco gets. This girl is covered in goosebumps, but she's so intent on getting that portrait for her website. She's standing there, and I'm using her boyfriend to um, hold on the reflector and throw some golden light on her. We're very immersed in the, you know, making this image, and then when I'm done, I turn around and realize there's five tourist buses behind me. <laughs> and there are about 100 people lined up, all with their cameras out, smiles year to year, going, ah, California. <laughs> <laughs> I know I made Wendy happy that day, but I must say I made a lot more people happy that day. So finding your niche. I even tried my hand at newborn photography. You see what I did there? My hand at newborn photography. <laughs> and I am a pediatric radiologist by training, which means I work with newborns. I scan them for hip dysplasias. And they usually come to me when they're six weeks old. So I'm like, I know how to handle babies. I manipulate their hips. How hard can it be to take their pictures? So I dappled in newborn photography. The more I did newborn photography, the more my expression became like that of that baby's. It's like, it wasn't really my thing, you know. So these are all the things I tried, portrait event, street, environmental portraits. And then gradually, the people in my picture started getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally, they just disappeared altogether. But this goes back to that purpose I was talking about, where if I want to display images in a hospital, obviously, I cannot be shooting people. I have to be shooting something, find a niche, where it will serve my purpose. So that's what I encourage you to do. By the way, if you haven't heard the good news, we have seven feet of snow coming this week to the Eastern Sierra, which means this scene is about to unfold, people. I say we all just jump into the cars and drive there after this conference. <laughs> okay, moving on. I don't like slides with a lot of text. I tend to tune them out, so I apologize for this. But I just wanted to put this out there to say there are so many different ways you can monetize your photography. I like to divide it into two main arms, 
the site that is image making sort of, and the site that is educational. And these are not mutually exclusive. So you will have to ask yourself, what do I do well? Once you answer that question, then you can start to explore what are the different avenues I can use to monetize my photography. I like to teach, so for me, workshops are a great um, way to do it. Um, and if you are an explorer, perhaps guiding is a good thing to do. Um, if you just like making reels or something, you know, content creation, uh, if you like to collaborate with brands, I mean, so many ways. I think when I last Googled it, it said 56 different ways to make money in photography or something like that. So I don't have to go through that list, but I do want us all to reflect on the strengths and weaknesses we have and how we can hone down on the niche that should be ours in this field. Let's take print sales, for example. You go, well, Sapna, that's all fine and dandy. I make good pictures, but you need to tell me where I can sell my prints because there is so much competition. Yes, there is. This image that you're looking at on the left-hand side, last light on Horsetail Falls, we know about this phenomena, right? We're all California, Californians, so we know about this. Galen created this image in 1973. At that time, back in 1959, Ansel Adams had photographed this phenomena, but he did it in gray tones, black and white. Nobody really appreciated that image. And then Galen comes around, and he creates this image in 1973. And if I can use the term, it went viral even back then. Since then, it has inspired so many of us to go back there and shoot these images, right? Galen sold hundreds of copies of that print what is the chance that you or I have a chance to sell this picture now? Very low. Why is that? Because we are not being innovators. We are emulating something that has already been done. So when we talk about print sales, we have to be creating art that is unique, that is original, and that is needed in the space that you're trying to target. Maintaining high quality and um, networking, through art shows, I know fr I have friends who go from art show to art show with tons of prints in their truck, and they are good at marketing and sales. Can you do that? Then yes, print sales would be one way to go. But I feel it's important to start locally, right where you are. I have a client, Sister Grace. She's a nun, but she likes photography. I should say, and she likes photography. So what she did is she borrowed a used camera from the church, went out into the garden, started creating images, and before you know it, she had a collection of floral images. Then she was like, what do I do with my images now? Aha, what if I put them on the cover of hymn books? People come into the church, they need a cover for the hymn books, so she put them out. Before you know it, it was not just one church or two church, now there's a whole region of churches that are using her cover for the hymn books. And the next thing she was like, let me be a little bit more ambitious about this. What if I can generate tens of thousands of dollars to build an orphanage in Africa? She had gone for a mission to Africa, seen the conditions there, and she felt moved by it and said, I have a greater purpose in life now. I want to use my photography to generate enough funds to fund this orphanage. So she comes back. She collects all those floral images that she used for the hymn books and says, I'm going to make a photo book out of this. By now, people who came to the church saw her work. So as luck would have it, a publishing company came forward and said, that's a noble cause. We'll publish that book for you. And they did. And then a very wealthy family came in and said, well, that's a noble cause. We'll buy 75% of the books that you're going to publish, and 25% can go to the rest. Next thing you know, she has the orphanage up and running in Africa. So you see. Wherever you are, there are opportunities, but we need to think outside the box and say, what can I do to make this work for me? And you start small and then scale up. Which brings us to tip number four, a business plan. Did I have a business plan when I first started monetizing images? No, most of us don't. Is it absolutely essential to have one? No, but it's nice to have a roadmap, isn't it? So all that a business plan does is forces you to sit down, reflect upon your journey in photography, and ask yourself, where am I headed on this journey? 
So if you have a description of the business, who you essentially are, what are the products and services you offer, who is your target audience? How are you going to reach them? What is your marketing strategy? What are your goals? What are you gonna go do for in the next six months, in the next year? What are you gonna do in another five years? Having that sort of discipline and setting yourself goals makes it easier to travel in this business world. So I suggest we all do that. And that brings us to tip number five. I can't just be talking about these dry topics without talking about the images, guys. Isn't this a spectacular image? So let me just pause for a second and talk about this. This is Degle in Namibia, okay? So there is a river that sort of comes towards the ocean, travels through the desert, and never really makes to the ocean and just dries up, so it's like huge salt pan. And in the middle of the salt pan, these dead trees are so graceful in their architecture, so that's what people go to photograph. The trick here is to wait till the light traverses in such a way that the salt pan is in shadow and the dune behind it is in light. So that's what we do here. Wait for that right decisive moment and then you get this nice separation between warm and cold and this beautiful um, minimalistic image. So one of the most important steps in the business of photography is to have a really good website. You now people often just brush that aside. They say, I have it on Instagram, I have it on Flickr or whatever. No, because you need a website in order for you to look legitimate, in order for you to look professional, in order for you to go ahead with the legal implications that will develop in the business of photography. So what does a website need to do? Another image from the bayou. Some of the things are self, very intuitive, isn't it? You want it to be reliable and efficient, it has to be aesthetic, you have to be able to manage it. But some of the more important things that people tend to neglect when they first start a website is one, it should be tied to an e-commerce platform. So even if you don't have anything to sell at this point, the idea is that you're setting yourself a goal where you will generate an income from the work or products or services that you're offering on the website. So when you're developing a website, keep that in the back of your mind and say, I need to be able to integrate an e-commerce platform. So you could do that on something like Wix or Squarespace and have like an integrated platform from the start. SmugMug does that too. But if you're using a WordPress or something that is more custom, then you have to go and uh, link a Shopify or something like that. An e-commerce platform has to be linked from the very beginning to your website. And the other thing I would highly encourage you to do is to have a newsletter sign up, right? Because Instagram changes its algorithm every two, three months. All social media platforms do that. How are you gonna reach your target audience? The newsletter is where they're coming and subscribing to you and that there is no algorithm. So you, when, when you send something out, you know you have a captive audience. So uh, ask people, encourage people to sign up for the newsletter and always share your testimonials. It's kind of like, you know, when you go on Amazon and you're looking at the Amazon rating before you buy something? Similar to that, people come to your website. They're gonna look at the testimonials. What do others have to say? So if they come to my website and say, we wanna take a Sapna Ready workshop, like what did the others say about the workshop experience? And I have the unique advantage of sharing just the good testimonials so I can make it look really good, right? in terms of rating, so definitely take advantage of that. Number six, I want to talk a little bit about the business structure. Let's just look at this image for a second, because I know if I talk only about business, you'll fall asleep. So look at the image. This is, again, these giant sand dunes are hundreds of feet high, and the way the light falls on them gives a beautiful separation between warm and cool colors, and the trees add a sense of scale. A business structure is how you want to um, make your business entity look. So what does that mean? What are the startup costs you want to incur? What are the government regulations you're willing to endure? What kind of liability protection you're looking at? And what are the tax implications? If you get nothing else from this talk, I want you to get what I'm about to say next. I encourage you all, when you start your business in photography, to do a limited liability company. For a lot of us, we have other assets that we would like to protect, okay? To put it very simply, small businesses have two business structures. One is sole proprietorship and the other is an LLC. 
in a sole proprietorship, there is a single owner, a single manager, he's everything. And if that business entity gets sued, all that the owner has will be sued, which means the personal assets, the car, the house, the personal bank balance, everything is liable. In an LLC, what you're essentially doing is separating your personal individual assets from the business assets. You're no longer responsible if the business does get sued. What ends up happening is they can only come after the assets of the business, but not your personal assets. And this is sort of important. It's very easy to do. You just go to legal Zoom if you want. Uh, if you don't want to hire somebody to do it for you, it takes about, I swear, less than 10 minutes to set it up. You shoot it off to legal Zoom. They take 60 bucks. They send you back some forms, another less than 100 bucks to the government forms. A couple of forms are submitted, and then 10 days later, you have your own LLC. Super easy to do. I actually went through it to make sure that I wasn't telling you something that was not true. The advantage of limited personal liability is that there is less paperwork, there's no shareholders, and you don't have to hold meetings and all of that stuff. There is a tax advantage, right? Because remember, once you are an LLC, you are now eligible to show losses. So all that gear you buy, you know, all those trips you're having, they're all now tax write-offs, yeah? Especially when you're just starting out and you have another income that you're trying to protect and sort of get a break with all the expenses that you're incurring in photography. For three consecutive years, you don't have to show a profit in the business of photography. That's a huge advantage, right? You can acquire all of the gear you need in that time. After the three years, if you show intent, you have a website, you have made a few sales, you're trying to sell stuff, but it's not working out. You're still incurring a little bit of a loss. You can still show that. I know people who have dragged it out for five years, but talk to your accountant. I am no accountant, so talk to your accountant and ask what is the best way to go about doing this. I mean, the cars you buy, the laptops, you know, there's so much stuff that goes into the business of photography that becomes a deductible expense. That's one of the biggest advantages of having an LLC, having a website, and showing intention to actually monetize your photography. If at the end of five years you find you're still struggling, maybe, maybe they were not cut out for the business of photography, but at least we have that amount of time to figure out what we're going to do with it. Building your brand, you know, the minute you say, I am going to pursue the business of photography, you actually become a brand. You, as an individual, are now a brand. So you have to reflect what a good brand would reflect. Quality, integrity, offer a unique value, make sure you retain your customers and your clients, and networking. You want to send out positive vibes to everyone involved and have brand collaborations. I know people always ask me this, Sapna, how do you get to brand collaborations? Because that sounds like a sweet deal, right? I am a Sony ambassador. I'm an ambassador for Guragear and an ambassador for Nisi. I work with b and and Adobe as an educator. And for Flickr, PhotoPills, Heat Company, and some other companies, I work as a content creator. How did this come about? I'm going to tell you frankly how this happened. I did not chase after any of these things particularly. I was using a Gura Gear camera bag for five to seven years and just posting pictures of myself carrying the bag on social media platforms before somebody in Gura Gear noticed it. I did not even tag them, mention them, or anything. But somebody noticed and said, this girl is using the Gura Gear bag. They reached out and said, would you like to be a brand ambassador? I, have, I would like to believe that it was those images that I posted on social media had a certain amount of quality to them that they felt she can be a representative of our brand. So it was a very organic experience. For Sony, what they do is they actually, like big um, camera companies, they have scouts. They're actively looking for brand ambassadors because we are the ones who market the products, right? So they have scouts. These scouts are keeping an eye out for your posts. So say you're using a Sony camera, and you post and you say, I use the A7R4 with such and such a lens, and 
you know, these filters and this tripod, those brands are paying attention. And when you get traction on social media, they go, this person would be a good representative for our brand. So having shown chronicity, you know, a time frame over which you're using these products, being honest about it, investing your time and saying this is a really good quality product. And then the most important thing that people sometimes forget is your online persona. Brands don't like it if you're heavily opinionated or get into fights or arguments, you know, or somebody gives you a suggestion and you're like, you can go suck an orange, I'll post whatever I want to post, you know. You might feel that on the inside, but realize that you are now a brand, you're not an individual, and therefore what comes out on your uh, online platform should be clean. And it should not, you know, in any way show lack of humility or lack of professionalism. And if you do that, you're watched, you know, for a few years, and then you eventually might get that uh, ambassadorship program. For Sony, I know they have a Facebook group, the Sony Alpha Facebook group, and if you post in that constantly, they're always picking people up from that group as well. Other opportunities, I know Nissi, I got recruited because I was presenting at a conference, they heard me talk, and Jim, uh, you know, came up to me and he said, Sapna, this would be a good fit, you are already using Nissi filters, you should come on board. So usually that kind of organic growth works well. There have been a couple of opportunities where I was asked to, to become an ambassador for a product before I tried it, and I'm telling you, it's a big mistake. I made that mistake. You know, I, I said, okay, I'll represent your company. I got the product, and then I found that I, when I took it out, it wasn't quite as good as the other product I had been using, and so I found it very difficult to tell my clients to buy it. I couldn't. So I kept recommending the other product and then eventually I was like, I wrote back to them and said, I can't be your ambassador because I, I can't even recommend your product. So I think uh, that sort of honesty and integrity is very critical. Okay, moving on. This is very important, investing in personal growth. You know? uh, this was way back, I think maybe like 2012 or something and uh, maybe even earlier, I went to Yosemite, I had heard about the moon bows, right, the rainbows forming in the moonlight, so I get there at night, I set up at lower uh, Yosemite Falls, there is probably about 50 photographers in line with me, and I stand there, I focus in the night, I'm super happy, I actually got some sort of focus going, I take a picture, I look at it in the viewfinder, step back and say, this is it, in a loud voice, shows you how humble I am, this is the best photograph of moon bows. That's it. With 50 people around. Ignorance is bliss, isn't it? I was so dumb. I did not know what I did not know. And so I was very happy with what I got. You know, the fact that the water hardly has any texture, there's all this motion blur in the trees, probably cut off some of that, no shadow detail, blah, blah. All of that came later. I think it's very, very important to invest in personal growth and understand what are the things I don't know. The more I shoot, the more I feel, the less I know. <laughs> you know, There's so much more to know, but you only realize that as you invest in personal growth. So this is my goal. Every week I tell myself, you have to learn one new thing, just one new thing a week. It could be anything. It could be like, say, flying a drone, or it could be a new post-processing technique, or it could be learning how to focus stack, perspective blend, whatever it is that you want to pick. One goal a week, but at the end of the year, think of all the things you have learned. At the end of 10 years, think of all the things you have learned. Keeping oneself occupied with personal growth is extremely important because if we don't do that, we lose relevance. And we'll get, uh, we will not be able to succeed in that business. And moving on. I love this picture, guys. This was also in uh, Namibia, and uh, absolutely love those sand dunes, and you know, I was uh, chasing some oryx in the light, and all of a sudden we turn around, and we see this disparity in the shadow and the light on the sand dunes, and this little solo tree had like that sliver of light going across it. Absolutely loved the scene. Uh, ran back towards it and photographed it. One of my favorite images from Namibia. And I just want to mention that networking, marketing, and community over competition are the pillars on which we should be building our business. 
you never know where the opportunity is going to come from. You know, B&H, I actually did not know anybody in B&H. It was a friend who was presenting at one of the conferences, and I said, oh, how do you do that? And she said, oh, I know somebody who, one of my friends works for B&H, so I'll just put you in touch, and she did. And that's how I got into B&H. So you never know where opportunities come from. It's important to be polite to everyone, and you know, the doors open automatically. Um, works great for marketing as well. And this feeling that I was talking earlier about community over competition, we are all part of a larger family. And I think there is enough for all of us. And if we uh, develop a culture where we are fighting over each other, you know, fighting with each other over the same slice of pie, it becomes a very unpleasant experience. Instead of that, I think it's better to think outside the box and see what can I do a little bit differently that others are not doing, and so reduce the competition for myself. And that brings us to the last uh, tip, because I wanted only 10 tips. I added a bunch of tips in the last tip, as you can see. I said, do not compare yourself, OK? You are on an individual journey. There will always be someone who is way better than you, and there will always be someone who is trying to catch up to you, always, no matter how good you are. So it doesn't make sense to compare yourself. You know those times when you feel a creative rut? You feel like, God, everybody's taking over. I'm not going anywhere. I suggest you open up Instagram and go to the regular pages, not the ones you follow. Look at all the garbage over there. You're going to feel so good. You're going to feel so good about your images. Your confidence is going to be right by like those people. That's nonsense. What I'm doing is much better. If you are looking at people who are performing at a higher level, it is to draw inspiration from them, not to berate ourselves. So we need to stay inspired. And I think, you know, we become so serious that sometimes we forget to have fun. And my clients, God bless them, when I get intense, they start imitating me because <laughs> I have a certain way of talking. I'm like, this is it, guys. This is it. You better be getting the shot. So then when we go back to the house, they're like, this is it, guys. This is it. You better get it. You know, they're like just making fun of me. I'm sure they're watching now and laughing, even as I say this. But it's important to do that. It's important to have fun on this journey. So I was in Indonesia, and I was uh, trying to get this waterfall absolutely perfect, you know, with the red foliage around it, very meticulous about the texture of the waterfall and everything. And one of my clients had a very different idea about how to shoot. So you see, I had to share that as a story. You know, I remember, and there was another picture where we were standing at uh, the Asian volcano. We had hiked uh, several hours to get to the summit, and we are there at dawn trying to catch it. And he's standing there, and there are fumes coming out of the volcano, and he's just pretending like it's his smoke. You know, that sort of thing. Uh, I think that's very endearing. I think maintaining not taking yourself too seriously, you know, like Lizzie said yesterday. I think it's important to keep that in mind and have fun on this journey. Well, going back to the original one, it is very tempting to be that second stone cutter who's so focused that you want to be the best in your field. But I want to remind you, if we do that and lose the big picture, the journey can become very stressful very quickly as you can see right here. So I encourage you to be the third kind of stone cutter who takes in the big picture and realizes this is a community effort. We are creating art together, and the art will be our legacy. It will live long after we are gone, right? And we're making this world a better place one image at a time. Keeping that in mind and the bigger purpose will reduce the stress we place upon ourselves on the day-to-day -day tasks that need to get accomplished in order to get monetary gain. I just want to thank you all again for giving me this opportunity. Um, I really enjoy speaking to people who share this common passion with me. So b &H, thank you so much. Uh, I, and as usual, you know, the best, the most important rule <laughs> of business, you can't stop hustling, gotta hustle. So here's my hustle. I'm doing workshops, people. <laughs> Get to them. Okay, that's it. Thank you all so much. <laughs>